that's why when they say when you're meditating keep your body completely still i know it's a, there's times when your eyebrow itches or <laughs> you know that that but you should try and strive to keep it perfectly still you know be still and know that i'm god you know that there's no more profound truth than that really this is unconditioning discovering the voice within with whitney and jenkins Hello, and welcome to the 37th episode of Unconditioning, Discovering the Voice Within, where I bring on guests and we talk about the inner authentic voice and the challenges and the rewards that come from following it. This week I have with me Ray Ray. Ray Ray is an astrologer, an author, and a novelist from Liverpool. He specializes in tools such as the future self-shifting, shadow work, astrology, and yoga meditation. And these have all been helpful in his own life. So he's developed methods to help others achieve support and find their full circle way in aiding and reconnecting to the innermost child and bringing your future self into the present. Ray Ray also specializes in starseed astrology, which dives into past life presences on different planets. So that's really intriguing and fascinating. And a lot of this conversation has a lot of wisdom and wealth to it. So I'm really excited to introduce you to Ray Ray. Is it like a bank holiday over there in America today, like Easter Monday? Um, I feel like it's sort of like not really established but kind of understood it's not really a a written rule but some people consider it one and yeah it feels like another Sunday here it's like we get two Sundays I used to get so nervous when I used to come on podcasts at first but now I just don't really care oh yeah um there's nothing nothing to worry about at all I talk about following uh, your inner voice and okay and how you've accomplished that along the way to get to where you are Right. I'm sure you have a lot of wisdom in the, in this regard. Um, I read some things in your um, book, so yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Have you been reading the book? How do you how are you finding it? I like it a lot because you write about some subjects that could be very complex, but mm. they're very easily understood for me to read. Yeah, um, yeah. Everyone says says that. To be honest, um, mm. that the my writing style, I just have a a, a way of making things seem really simple and Mm -hmm. I think that's really the key nowadays as well simplicity you know um a lot of um troops are are woven in like allegories and myths Mm -hmm. and everything and within that day and age where we just need to be bluntly told what is you know what we need to do how we need to do it etc yeah uh, and the subject matter is interesting in a way that if if people don't understand the substance behind what is being said, then it can be seen as like speaking very broadly and not very specifically, if that makes sense. Well, everyone, the thing is about it, I mean, no books for everyone, don't get me wrong. I've got a lot of great reviews on Amazon already. There's one guy who gave me a one star review, <laughs> but it, that's always going to happen. I'm thick skinned, so I don't care. But, um, You know, but most people can relate to it because everyone's being raised by parents who, you know, generally done a good job. Most most people's parents did, but subconsciously or unconsciously, should I say, they're still passing down trauma without even realizing that they are from their previous generations. And that's, you know, really what I'm addressing in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really important um, because those traumas bubble up um, unexpectedly, I feel, especially right now. Um, and all the changes that are happening well well yeah the frequency of the planet and, and our collective consciousness is raising and as a result of that more and more of that debris of the past is coming up but also you know it's important to really do the inner work in this generation so we don't pass on a lot of those there's still going to be things the next generation are going to have to deal with you know but we can make it a little easier for them if we do the work you know ourselves just to lighten the load a little and then when they do the work too they'll lighten the load on the next generation and so on and that's how we actually evolve yeah. as a civilization you know mm-hmm. the, the next generation should always be a little better more evolved more advanced than we are you know that's my my understanding otherwise yeah. in my opinion we fail as a generation that's yeah. the way i look at it and it's it's sad but it's true mm-hmm. yeah i leave the place a little better than you left it <laughs> that's it that's exactly exactly 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so one of the first things that I like to ask my guests when they come on the podcast is this, and then we can go wherever from here. Okay. When is the first time that you realized that you had an inner voice of your own and it wasn't influenced by your environment or your family or Ooh. your parents? <sighs> okay. Um, that's a complex question, but I'm looking forward to answering. So basically... I've always had, since I was a child, an inner voice. For some reason, I don't know why. Like, I, I honestly don't know why, but I've always known that there was a higher form of intelligence within us. Um, some people call that God, the source, whatever. I've always known that that existed. However, I was raised in a Catholic church, um, Catholic school, sorry, and, you know, you know what their beliefs are like. They they separate us from the source. That never really resonated with me. I didn't really know who Jesus was or anything like that. But then, like everyone else, you know, my ego developed as I grew up a little bit. And I ended up, because Liverpool is a rough city, to be honest. You know, this is where I'm from. I'm raised. I still live here. Um, I ended up intermingling with the wrong people, basically. Ended up on drugs, alcohol, you know. And this continued for nine years from the age of 14 to 23. Mm-hmm. I would just the the yearnings of my inner child, you know, which has always been, you know, I've always been passionate since I was a kid of like, you know, UFOs and aliens and like ghost hunting, like things like that, paranormal things. Yeah. I would always love those since I was a kid. But when I went through that dark tunnel of society's influence, I really lost touch with that. But there were so many times during that period where I'd come home after a night out with all my mates and everything and that inner voice would be there telling me to do better, telling me that I'm better than this, telling me that I'm living below myself, below my potential, that I'm not being true to myself, etc. And that really culminated on January the 16th, 2010. I know the date and it's because it's a day I'll never forget. I came home like 3 a.m. I had had cocaine that night. You know, I'm happy to admit that live because, you know, I've made peace with it. (laughs) Um, I had cocaine and I was drinking as well. And I come home and I just had a huge panic attack, like a massive one. I thought I was going to die quite literally because I was laying in bed trying to sleep on my dog who's passed away. No, bless him. He was laying at the end of my bed and, um, you know, I I was just feeling sweaty in the palm of my hands and I was trying to sleep and the voice... That inner voice was telling me, what the hell are you doing, man? You're, you're so much better than this. You can do way better. And it got to the point where my heart rate just went right up. I ran into my mum's bedroom screaming, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Help me. Help me. <laughs> like a little child. <laughs> I ran into my mum and she said, oh, shut up. Well, yeah, calm down. You'll be all right. Put your head out the window and you'll be fine. So I did that. I actually listened to my mum for once. Right, I put my head out the window and... Um, I managed to calm myself down, but then it's crazy the way she told me to look out the window. Like the synchronicity here is profound because the moment I done that, usually Liverpool, the UK has a reputation, doesn't it, for being a like a cl- cloudy kind of country. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. it's a very cloudy, rainy kind of place. But on this night in particular, it was a winter night in January. The sky was just so clear. I could see everything, right. everything in the sky. And it was just so profound. And I remember looking up at Orion and Sirius is at the bottom left-hand corner of Orion, the star system of Sirius. And the brightness of that star just really encapsulated me. At the time, I didn't know that it was actually Sirius I was looking at. And we'll get into that later on. But um, anyway, I saw a huge shooting star fly across the sky the moment I looked out the window. And that triggered something in me it felt like God was speaking to me in that moment. And I felt this eruption of energy in the bottom of my spine. Mm -hmm. And and this determination just arose within me. And I remember putting my fist out the window like this, like like this. And I just remember saying, it's now or never. This is it. Are you going to actually do something about this? Or are you going to continue to go down this timeline where you probably just end up killing yourself? You know, and I made that changes and I've been clean ever since. Well, I woke yeah. up a completely different person, like completely different person. I haven't, I've never had any cravings for drugs or that kind of lifestyle since. And that was over 12 years ago. And I, I think it's really, I mean, that 
shooting star maybe it wasn't even a shooting star maybe it was like an et ship or something because i've had contact with ets as well this may sound weird but i've actually had numerous same experiences since with those beings as well and yeah it's just really profound what's happened to me i woke up a new version of myself and i sincerely believe that i shifted to an alternate alternate timeline on that night Mm -hmm. as a result of that and yeah and ever since then but like after that it's not as if i was completely healed after that i still had to come to terms with why i was running away from myself in the first place etc mm-hmm. that's where a lot of the you know shadow work and the yeah. emotionality the working with those fears and emotions and beliefs etc come in and without all of that i wouldn't have wrote my book the labyrinth of course you know it got to a point where i had severe hypochondria for a few years that i, I went to a therapist mm-hmm. um, and the therapist actually told me that he's not worried about me at all. He thinks that I'm on the verge of self-actualization um, because I was so aware of what's going in, on inside of me. He said, you should be doing what I'm doing, to be honest. That's what he told me. So that gave me a lot of confidence and belief in myself. And yeah, I've healed myself of hypochondria too. Um, I, I didn't need any medication. They did give me that diazepam. But I took one and it just made me feel awful. So I just stayed away from any form of medication. And I just learned how to, you know, accept my emotions and work mm-hmm. with that inner voice instead of trying to fight it yeah and and that's really yeah so when I was younger the inner voice has always been there but then I lost touch with that obviously when I went completely unconscious and I was a drug addict etc but then I reawoken and you know re-emerged so to speak yeah. around 12 years ago yeah do you remember if there was anything in particular that sort of drew you away from that voice or was it just the process of growing up and Uh, well um that's a good question i think external factors are really significant especially when you're completely unconscious because you allow them everything to define you externally other people's opinions you know etc they could you you see yourself through the eyes of other people instead of seeing yourself through your own eyes because you've adopted all of their belief systems. And it wasn't so much my parents that I don't even want to say messed me up because that's a victim mentality. No one really messes us up. Ultimately, you know, I I take responsibility for everything, but the influence of my friends in particular, when I was between around the ages of 14 to 21, you know, really messed with my head a lot. Mm -hmm. They made me believe that I'm someone that I'm not, you know, made me question my sexuality just so many little things you know that really even though it may seem like a laugh and a joke to them you know it really deeply scarred me on many levels Mm -hmm. and yeah so the influence of society I really just wanted to be like everybody else I was scared of being ostracized by everyone else Um, I didn't know who I was so I just wanted to be like everyone like I dressed like them, I talked like them, I reacted to situations like them. I just become a carbon copy of everyone else around me instead yeah. of really being who I truly am. And even though I I endeavoured to try and do that, I still didn't fit in. Yeah. <laughs> I still didn't fit in because I, I, I got bullied. I was always the one who, you know, got picked on and everything when I was a kid. I've always been a little different and weird. I mean, I own that now. That's fine. I'm not, I'm not afraid of that. You know, I I actually cherish that about myself that I am very different and and, and a bit weird, but you know. Yeah. It sounds like you were were trying to to hide your light. Hmm. I didn't even know I had light in me. Yeah. You know, Mm. that's the thing though. I didn't know. I didn't know. But then after the, the 2010 experience, like so many things have happened so many profound you know levels of awakening because we don't just awaken once there's different right. stages isn't there there's mm-hmm. the, it keeps happening and i don't think we ever stop growing and developing as people either so you know it's an interesting journey to be on and it's it sounds like if you didn't go through all of those experiences and those low points that you might have not have um, gotten to that profound experience that you were describing well that's uh, it yeah that's it like it's just a stepping stone you know, and, and it's usually the people who do great things in the world who have the most difficult past because, you know, those tough times help them realize who they truly are. The stars can't shine without darkness, you know, mm-hmm. and the darkness, those dark days, so to speak, 
can really enlighten the light of our true self because it shows us who we're not mm -hmm. you know yeah. and yeah that's how i use that all in the contrast yeah exactly you and you described a feeling and a sensation in the base of your spine would you liken that to some sort of kundalini awakening absolutely yeah because but it only reached my heart on that night it didn't go straight up to the third eye but the year after well not the wait there no it was about six or seven months after then i had the full kundalini i was laying in bed i actually got a job that year too i was working in some biscuit factory in liverpool um and i was trying to sleep for work i had work the next morning and um i was just in bed i didn't by the way i didn't know what a kundalini was either like completely fresh to all of these concepts <laughs> mm -hmm. like just just laying in bed and with my eyes closed i'd often see a big purple ball of energy just here and it would pulsate all the time and sometimes i'd see faces come through it like it's a doorway like it's another dimension like a gateway and the third eye is that i've I found out years later but um the first time i saw that purple like here i was laying in bed trying to sleep for work and i was just usually when you close your eyes you can just see pure blackness yeah darkness mm -hmm. yeah. but i i saw this purple ball of energy i was like what the hell is that and then as I inhaled and exhaled, it got bigger and it kept growing and growing and growing. And all of a sudden something popped inside of me. Like, like, like I didn't like physically feel it pop, but like this ball of energy just popped. And I just seen this just purple energy all in my third eye. All of a sudden I just come out my body and I was um, visited by this blue being. Like if you've ever seen like those pictures of the, those extraterrestrials who look like just blue etheric beings, like they've got no facial features. They just look like two arms, two legs, those kind of like baldy heads. Like like this being has visited me a few times now. And one time was when that Kundalini hit my my third eye and I came up my body. I was in some void where I didn't know where I was. I was beyond space and time. His body kept um, materializing and dematerializing around me. I think he was there to help facilitate Mm -hmm. You know, while I was calibrating to do this new energy state, while the Kundalini was activating, and he's actually told me he's my future self as well, so he's another version of me. And I, I get a feeling like that maybe he activated me, mm -hmm. maybe it was him who activated me. Maybe sometimes future versions of ourselves come back in time to you know activate other versions of ourselves to help us, our soul, go down a different path or something. I don't know. I mean, I don't know all the answers at all, but yeah, yeah. it was profound. That, that definitely sounds like it. So, so since that moment, um, are you able to easily get into like the the realm of that? Do you have yeah. a, a method? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I mean, I I do kriya yoga as well. You know, have you heard of Paramahansa Yogananda? Mm -hmm. um, yes, the, yeah, aut mm -hmm. aut aut yeah he's he's actually one of my teachers um he's visited me in dreams many times and so is babaji and jesus as well um because i was raised catholic like i said before when i stumbled upon his teachings it was in 2011 that i really st stumbled upon yogananda and his stuff just resonated so mm -hmm. much with me like it's a, a, like i'd always known it like i'm just re-remembering re it and um, but at first there was a little bit of doubt in me, like subconsciously, because of that Catholic upbringing. You know, if it's not Jesus, it's from the devil, like all that. You know, and I, I actually prayed one night, and I said, "Is this really from God?" Because it sure does feel like it. You know, and that night I fell asleep and had a dream about Jesus and Yogananda together. Oh, wow. That both of them came to me, and Jesus said, "Follow his teachings." practice meditation every day and i'll be honest i did not practice meditation every day <laughs> you know sometimes i get a bit distracted but i've i do practice meditation but like all this many years later 10 years later like it's like i don't practice meditation anymore it's like i became meditation yeah it's, it's different like because mm -hmm. i'm a writer and i'm a creator okay. i do many things now that mm -hmm. just put me in that natural like channeling and you know creative state that meditative state yeah. now so i'm not saying i don't need to sit there and close my eyes and, and i do do that too still but you know it's almost as if like 
my entire reality is just becoming more lucid and more real mm-hmm. in the sense that you know the more you become conscious the colors get brighter the experiences you feel them more you know everything becomes more vivid and lucid the more you awaken but back to your question sorry i went off track there a little <laughs> no, um, that's the, totally the, okay. the, the biggest technique that i use and I stumbled upon this accidentally as well. Like not many people do this. Most yoga teachers and meditation teachers tell you to sit up and meditate either on a chair or with your, with your legs crossed, etc. But I've had the most profound experiences laying in bed, right? <laughs> like I said, <laughs> me Kundalini awoken while I was in bed, you know, right. like, like, but like just laying flat on my back, right? I keep my body completely still and I just focus at the point between my eyebrows and that's it. That's all I do. And sometimes I, I see myself flying down tunnels into other dimensions. I've had so many crazy experiences doing that. Like you've got to be so still in the body that you can't feel it anymore. And that's what happens. You go beyond the identification with your physical form when you actually keep the body perfectly still because also stillness in the body creates stillness in the mind too. And not many people see that correlation. That's why they, that's why when they say when you meditate and keep your body completely still. I know there's, there's times when your eyebrow itches or <laughs> you know that that. But you should try and strive to keep it perfectly still. You know, be still and know that I am God. You know, that's just no more profound truth than that, really. And that's like you said, the inner voice. It's not even as if. At times, yeah, it may manifest as if like it uses thoughts to communicate to you, but really that inner intelligence, it doesn't use words. That stillness speaks to you in a very different way. Yeah, You know, you just know things without knowing how you know, you know, and that's just um, another profound thing that I've realized. Nice. Okay. So you also do a lot of work with astrology. Oh, yeah. And... And uh, so I, how did you get into that? I've always, like like I said, when I was a child, I've always been interested in planets, the stars. I had a big poster of all the planets in our solar system on my bedroom wall when I was a kid. You know, so I'd always been interested in space and everything, you know, just generally speaking. But when I'd say maybe around 2011 or 2010, it might have been, I just started reading astrology books and speaking to astrologers. And over time, I've just developed my own understanding of of the science and I've developed really my own way of looking at it. I don't really use astrology to help people try and predict the future. Okay. I'm, I'm a bit against that. Actually, I don't like to use it for divination. I like to use it to help people grow, help people become more self-aware, help people really align with their chosen karmic path in this life. Because I sincerely believe that we do choose certain themes and situations that we're going to experience in this life on a soul level, you know, like karmic things, like karmic themes and lessons, etc. We still have a great degree of free will, but how you experience those things and when you experience those things is up to you, you know. And whether you overcome the certain challenges that pertain to those lessons as well is also up to you, isn't it? So that's a that's another form of free will. Um, so yeah, I really help people align with their very best self in this life. With the lunar nodes in astrology, especially, that's what I work with. Um, the lunar nodes really, it's like a hint from your higher self, like like or your soul or, or God or whatever. It's like a hint saying they there's there's your true self right there. I really do find that when people become perfectly balanced between the North and the South node, they find that balance between those signs, then yeah, they align perfectly with their true selves. Because the two signs that the lunar nodes are in shows that there's a karmic imbalance between that duality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a kind of imbalance. They're, they're usually more, they're, they're more in the South node than the North node. That's why the North Node should be the focus in this life. But of course, you've got to also deal with all of the complexities within the South Node before the North Node can truly blossom. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, um, I've, I've experienced that myself. I understand that for sure. <laughs> well, where's your nodes? Where, where's okay. your nodes? My my South Node is in Sagittarius. My North is oh, in Gemini. <laughs> Gemini? Well, look at that. Like, literally, your North Node is in Gemini. You all, you have a podcast, Gemini is the sign of communication. <laughs> yeah. Like like when people align 
with their, you know, they find that balance between Sagittarius and Gemini, they actually become a messenger for truth, like, mm-hmm. like, like a messenger. And you've literally got a podcast. You're doing what you need to be doing quite, quite clearly. So congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm working on it. We're, we're just getting started. So <laughs> we'll see yeah. where this leads. What about yeah. you? What, what is yours? Mine's Aries. My North Node is Aries, South Node's Libra. So having a Libra South Node, obviously, the scales, you know, there's a lot of indecisiveness when it comes to Libra energy in its lower expression. Um, so obviously, when I was younger, I just didn't know what the hell, who the hell I was, where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do, anything. I'd always split myself in half and try and bring harmony to both sides instead of just being more assertive and choosing a side and sticking with it. That's really what the Aries North Node is all about. Um, And I've realized that the the way to cure that is simply by knowing thyself. When you know yourself and you know who you are, the rest of your life just falls into place, quite literally. Mm -hmm. Because when you know who you are, you know what you want to do, you know where you want to be, you know who you want to be with, etc. It all just falls into place. So with the Aries North Node, it's about developing a strong kind of personality that other people can rely on as well. Like Aries are seen as like leaders, et cetera. That's Mm -hmm. why they're the first sign. So like, it's like my soul's undergoing a new karmic cycle altogether because I've, I've started on my North node on the first sign of the Zodiac. And when people also have a North node in Pisces, you know, that's the end of like a karmic cycle as well, because that's the last sign. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But I'm glad you understand astrology. It makes this a lot easier for me to explain as well. Because some no, people, yeah, I, like, I explain this to some people and they look at me like I'm speaking Chinese. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just a beginner, um, but I feel like I understand the basic things. I have Aries as an ascendant, so um, I, wow, just, cool. I, just, I understand the fire. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that the, this is like honestly ten. Um, well. How old am I now? I <laughs> sometimes forget. <laughs> I am 35. So maybe, yeah, my Aries North Node probably began awakening when I was about 26 or something. Just after me awakening began, I'd say. Like that, because at first, in the initial stages of the awakening, there was a lot of South Node shit that I was dealing mm-hmm. with. A lot yeah. of that come up. and um, But then I, I met a girl, Cheryl, her name is... Um, and she's an Aries, so being with her for two years, you know, um, really helped awaken that in me. Yeah. And and ever since then, like I'm just yeah, I'm a go getter. Yeah. So so some people say that this South Node represents like your past life. Yeah. Of- okay. So from a linear perspective, it's true, of course, but reality isn't linear. It mm-hmm. just seems like it's linear. So like. It's not really your past lives, but it also is. That's the paradox. It's really weird. Like, (laughs) um, I'm actually writing a book about time, by the way, Um, at the moment. And I explain this on a deeper level. It's not done yet, but I thought I'd just throw that out there. But anyway, you've got to be able to look at reality from a linear and a non-linear perspective because Mm -hmm. both both perspectives are true in in some sense. Like, for example, you know, you have a physical body. That body is aging. Like, like the amount of time we, we've been speaking to each other, time is real as an experience, obviously, in some way, on this plane of existence. However, on, on the higher planes of existence, there is no linearity at all. The soul is timeless, quite literally. However, there's a difference between what I call, what we call a soul and what Bashar calls an oversoul. An oversoul is actually the aspect of ourselves, our greater selves, our true self, that experiences all of our lives simultaneously from the perspective of spirit. However, what you may deem as your past life, right, isn't really yours from from an individual soul level. It's just that the life you're identifying with and your current life, those two souls belong to the same oversoul. So So from an oversoul perspective, it's you. But from yeah. an individual soul perspective, it's not you. It's another person, but you're subconsciously plugged into that person and vice versa. They're drawing upon your experiences and, and vice versa as well. So when you look at astrology, 
yeah, astrology in some ways works from a linear perspective because it's cycles, planets, time, etc. But also you've got to be got to be able to see it from a non-linear perspective. Mm -hmm. So when you look at someone self-noting, you say, Oh, yeah, you were a witch in, in a past life and you were burnt at the stake, but you know, by the Roman Inquisition or whatever. You know, that's a common thing with like a Scorpio self note, for example. Then it's not, it is you from an oversoul level, yes, but from an individual soul level, no. What's happening is you're subconsciously plugged into that person and the experiences that they're having. And as a result of that, you're mirroring their behavior. Mm -hmm. So that's where a lot of the self nodal tendencies and habits and everything come from. And really, the inner work is learning how to close those connections that you don't prefer. Because every, you know, people are people, they have good times, they have bad times. Some people are very nice, some people aren't very nice. Mm -hmm. So it's just about learning from both sides of that spectrum. And especially from the contrast in order to become who you truly are. And, and they're also pulling information and, you know, wisdom from your, your life experiences as well. So that's how I look at the self node. Yes, for most people, when I do them a reading, like a kind of reading, I will just say from a linear perspective, because a lot of people don't really understand the multidimensionality of reality. Yeah, it's it can be very slippy <laughs> and fluid and malleable. Like it, like reality is so malleable, it's insane. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah, there, there's like a, a way of having to look at it from a very like big picture aerial view as well as like the details that's a good point yeah that's yeah. a good way of saying it mm -hmm. <laughs> which i feel like is kind of like my gemini sagittarius conflict <laughs> well there's your sagittarius self node right there because yourself you your your self node you you're coming you're probably somebody who's lived in a lot of indigenous um, lands in the past life and you're learning how to adapt to city life, being surrounded by so many people, the busyness, the traffic, you know, all the cars, the big buildings, everything. Maybe at times feels a little foreign to you, you know, especially in the initial stages of your incarnation, you probably found it a bit strange. Um, and you probably will be faced with the choice of living in the country or the city at some point in your life if you haven't yep. already. Yep. If you haven't already. Um, but like also the good the, the the higher expression of Sagittarius, of course, is that Sagittarius slash Jupiter energy um represents the higher self ultimately. It's the higher mind, and the higher self is beyond linear space and time. Right. So you're coming from a natural understanding. This is why your podcast is about that inner voice, because the inner voice is the higher self itself. Right. It's that intuitive self. It's that, like I said before, knowing stuff without knowing how you know. That's the higher self. Mm -hmm. The higher self, because it exists beyond linear linear time, can see the outcome of all the potential choices you could make in this life. It's just spread before it like all the timelines you could possibly experience that's how your intuition is like now nah, go left don't go right you know it can tell you it knows the outcome of everything so from that perspective there is no unknown to the higher self because it can see the outcome of everything you could potentially do but getting the ego to relax the physical self is the battle to getting the ego to not well not a battle but you know what i mean yeah. the challenge mm -hmm. should i say like getting the ego to relax Relax, and yeah. to trust in that inner self mm -hmm. it's all about trust in that surrender. guidance yeah. yeah because the survival instinct mm -hmm. the survival instinct in the brain the brain's designed to keep you alive basically you know the brain's designed to say oh no don't shit no you no, know don't go don't go don't go please <laughs> you know it, it freaks out every <laughs> it just yeah. freaks out you know so we've got to learn how to relax and trust in that natural ebb and flow of life which always get, gets us to where we need to go exactly when we need to be there if we let go and surrender oh yeah it's it's beautiful when you're able to do it but sometimes it's really challenging yeah but this is so profound actually i've just realized like your your south node is that inner voice type of thing but then your north node is all about communication and you know podcasting and writing and or speaking you know using your voice yeah using your voice like expressing your truth through your voice and that's what you're doing here so it, again, that just shows to me that you have found a really nice balance already between those two signs, because you're doing exactly what your your nodal access tells says, 
I mean, and I haven't even seen the rest of your chart. <laughs> just those two, just those two things alone, just those two lunar nodes show me like most of what people's life is all about. And that's why I always say from an evolutionary perspective, they're the most important aspect of the horoscope. And that's why I work with them. Yeah, it's very interesting because I didn't really know about the nodes until a few years ago because they're not really talked about um, mm, very yeah. much. Yeah, mm. in the in this culture, uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah, in India, it's more Vedic mm -hmm. astrology. It's more yeah. But like, what's crazy is how the North and the South Pole of the Moon can influence us, like like like, and influence our destiny so much. And it just goes to show the power that the moon has actually has over mm -hmm. us as well. The moon is a really big player, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. My moon is in Sagittarius also, so. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so's mine, by the way. Mine's in Sagittarius as well. Of course, of course it yeah. is. Okay, so so this is fun, but also you're, you do something called starseed astrology as well, which I, I find do, yes. really fascinating. So Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to try to explain that one oh okay <laughs> okay so basically because i've had a lot of extraterrestrial experiences myself my, mostly multi-dimensional experiences during my meditative um, practices and i'm open about these as well i know some people are going to be thinking he's an absolute nut job but you know that's fine um comes with the territory but anyway so I let me just first of all state that I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have those experiences. Right. Okay. I only like to do things that I know are real. And in my experience, these things are very real. Okay. Um, now I've had contact with my future self from Sirius B, right? And the experiences I had with that being, and I'm still having, by the way. He still visits me time and time again. He just doesn't come all the time because it'll interfere with my journey too much, he told me. So just every now and then he drops by. But um, that them experiences of actually talking to my future self in a different body, in a blue body, like literally peeled the space-time illusion, the linear space-time illusion from my perception. Mm -hmm. Like it was gone. I don't see, I, like I said before, Yes, we need to learn how to see reality from a linear and non-linear perspective, of course. But I mostly do see it from a non-linear perspective. Now, all things and all beings exist now. Everything exists now. All versions of yourself exist now. All versions of you, Whitney, mm -hmm. even Whitney, all versions of here exist now. All timelines, potentialities, possibilities, everything is now, thanks to that experience. So... I've had that experience and I want to help other people have that experience, right? And the testimony of my clients is just unbelievable. You should see what happens because I don't just teach people how, I mean, sorry, not teach. I don't just show people their past and future selves and other planets. I've also designed a meditation technique, which enables them to actually initiate contact with them as well. <laughs> okay. So like, like I do. And there's been a few people like I've done since last I started doing these starseed readings last May, so 11 months ago. And I think I've had one bad review and I've done, a, done over 300 readings. So most people like, yeah. like 99 points, like 7% of people love it, love it. And there's been so many people who are having amazing experiences with their ET selves now, thanks to these readings. Like one girl who's a very, I'm not going to say a name because privacy and all that, but one girl who's, who's recently become my friend in the last few months, she got a reading from me. She's a really amazing artist and she um, is having like full-blown contact with her Pleiadian selves, you know, like, but they've always been there connected to it. That's the thing. That's the thing I always tell people. You're already connected to all of these beings because they, they too, are other aspects of your oversoul collective. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? The Lunar Nodes readings really just pertain to your earthly encounters and experiences because it's the moon. The, the moon belongs to the earth. That's why it's more relevant to the, you know, but when these starseed readings, you know, I'm, I'm connecting people to their um, other selves from Sirius, 
many of the Orion systems, the Pleiades, Arcturus, Lyra, etc., all of these star systems. And yeah, people are having profound experiences um, in the meditation. The meditation is key because they don't need ships to, if they're highly evolved beings, they don't need ships to come here. Right. They don't need them. They just use that as a courtesy sometimes, you know, just to show us things, etc. But they can just appear like that anyway, because they're beyond linearity. They're beyond time, as we know it. The multi-dimensional entities, and really the entire point of my readings is to help people become aware of those already existing connections. So instead of them just being influenced subconsciously, like your other earthly lives influence you too you can draw inspiration from at will from these beings you can mm -hmm. draw guidance you can draw insights you can draw creative etc like so many different things by just connecting to their energy state and matching their frequency if you can meet them halfway up the vibrational scale you will initiate contact with them but the key to it the caveat is you've got to learn how to go beyond yourself and meditation only when you become pure consciousness and transcend that time-bound ego do you actually open the door for that kind of um, contact to occur? And I, I speak, like I said at the beginning of explaining this, I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't right. have the experiences mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. I know that it's the truth. And yeah, a lot of people are having a lot of fun with it. And that's yeah. what it's all about, really. Mm -hmm. I'm just helping people reconnect the dots of their oversoul collective so they can become more whole and whole within themselves. Yeah. And yeah, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and i know it's crazy too i developed the system myself as well the the uh, using the fixed stars i developed okay. this system mm -hmm. as well like it just came to me it just one day like like a bolt of lightning poof, just hit me last year and it was like okay i'll try this and the next minute boom like literally like my orders list hasn't been empty since mm -hmm. i started doing it okay. like yeah. I just, yeah. it's just insane you figured out who you are and uh, now you're on a roll. <laughs> and so, like I said, I'm weird. I am a bit weird, but I, but I enjoy it. I wouldn't be anyone else. Cheers to that. Yeah, absolutely. So the way that the astrology supports the star seeds is by looking at those fixed stars in someone's Yeah, room. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but, but I only use conjunctions um, of like two or three degrees. Like the orb is a lot smaller, obviously, because they're a lot further away. In the planets in our solar system so conjunctions oppositions squares and trines that's it i don't use sextiles or in conjunction aspects they're the weaker aspects I, I, I find that they're not very relevant but like for example if venus is involved with like sirius for example it means a female connection because venus is a female planet and then for example if you were to have venus in aquarius aquarius is more indicative of the future because Uranus slash Aquarius energy is all about the future. And, you know, like Saturn and Capricorn energy is more indicative of the past. And Mars is a male planet, for example. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many little um, nuances okay. and things that I've come to understand, yeah. And the accuracy is just insane. Like another girl who I've done the reading for, um, she didn't tell me this this reading, I mean, this experience before I'd done the reading for her, but she had so many connections to Arcturus in her chart, so many. It was kind of profound. I was like, whoa, what's going on here? And um, after I gave her a reading, she listened to it. She was like, oh, by the way, I've had experiences where I've had beings telling me I'm from Arcturus. Like, like, like so it, it's working. It really is working. <laughs> But ultimately, it's not about trying to just worship alien beings. And like a lot of people lose sight of the big picture, like you said before. Right, yeah. Because mm -hmm. really what it all comes down to, the reason why these beings are coming here and they're like, they're activating some of their, their past selves, for example, like it happened with me, is because they want us to evolve. They want us to expand our consciousness and to become ultimately like them. They want us to become timeless in our perception. And that's what really what ascension is, in my opinion. I, a lot of people in these new age and spiritual communities talk about, so I'm ascending, I've got ascension mm -hmm. symptoms and all that. But they don't really know what ascension is. Ascension, ultimately, to me personally, and you may not even agree with this, and that's fine if you don't, but ascension is to understand that you exist in all places simultaneously, that mm -hmm. there is no linear time. 
And when you realize you already are where you want to be, that's ascension to me. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so what, what have the benefits been for you to connect with this future self of yours? Oh, well, like I said before, it stripped the linear space-time illusion from my perception. So I became more timeless in my perception, which also, if you look on my website, you may have also seen that I do future self-building now with people as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, where I take people through a process of actually connecting to future versions of themselves in this incarnation and guiding them down the correct timelines that they prefer, the timelines that they prefer to experience. That's one thing that I've been helping people do thanks to that experience. But also I channel this being a lot, especially when I'm writing. Well, I mean, I do channel sometimes when I'm talking like this, um, when I'm in a correct state, but I'm I'm just learning how to find my voice vocally. I'm more of a writer. Mm -hmm. It comes through me in written form to I've learned how to be a better channel writing wise. But um also I'm I'm writing a story based on Sirius. At the moment, a, a sci-fi story called Blue Orca. You may have seen the picture on my website of like the, the one with the purple hair. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I want to teach in story form as well. Yeah. And, and this is a very spiritual kind of story, which explains ultimately the ascension of the Syrian collective and how they transcended linear time and duality, etc., and became timeless in their perception. So... That's a story that I am writing right now. I've already done volume one. It's been sent to the publishers. Um, so it should be out very soon. Um, so I'm channeling this being, and even though a lot of the story is fiction, there are certain undertones to the story, which are really true to how Syrian culture used to be before they actually became, you know, who they are in the here and now. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big believer that storytelling is a huge... Uh, thing within our culture that is very necessary for understanding yeah and integrating yeah because we when when a story moves you mm -hmm. it really does things to the subconscious as well yeah like like really profound things um and i i sincerely believe as well that some of my characters are real people as well real entities not all of them but a couple of them at least because I've like, had experiences yeah. with them yeah. they've visited me they've visited me like the, the exact appearance though as well there's one called Cherry she's got short red hair I had a dream that I was drawing her on a piece of paper and she jumped out of the paper and hugged me and called me father like like, like and she's came to me a few times and every time she sees me she calls me father and so I think they're real beings that I'm channeling here so that again, these are these are some of the things that I've experienced as a result of connecting to my future self. Yeah. So so if someone would like to work with you to find their future self or to work with you on astrology, where could we lead them to? Just rayray.co.uk, just my website. You know, everything's there. If you if you want to aim a reading or you want me to help you create your future self. Well, not create it because it already exists, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. But but um, also my book, The Labyrinth. Um, I've got a copy here. Well, we're not on webcam anyway, so it doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> <laughs> I keep thinking because I can see you. Yeah, well, whatever. It's okay. Um, uh, but my book, The Labyrinth, as well. I it, there's a chapter in it called Getting Creative. Um, create um, embodying your future self. Or something. I can't remember the chapter. No, but anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I've laid down the, the entire process in the book as well so you, if you can do it yourself you can do it yourself you don't even need me to help you you know I've only but at the end of the chapter I say if you, if you want further assistance then you can book a session a few sessions with me over the course of three, three weeks I do three sessions over the course of three weeks with people and that helps them you know to help them really guide them through that process but most people don't need me to help them that's why I just put it in the book so they can do it themselves you know so so that that future self building is also in my book the labyrinth so if you're interested in that it's on amazon and everywhere else really so yeah i'll put all of these links into the show notes so people can click on them really easily thank so, you yeah so i have one last question that i usually ask to wrap up okay and that is if your inner voice had a billboard what would it say to the world be the future be the future. That's it. That's why it's on my logo. What do I mean by be the future? 
okay a lot of spiritual teachers tell us to be in the present moment stay present stay present so why the hell are you saying be the future great i mean very very whatever right okay <laughs> because when you actually realize that you're timeless in your perception and you master the here and now you also realize that you have access to all other versions of yourself from the present moment present moment is the window of creation without a doubt and i do encourage people to stay present however you can from the present moment connect to any future version of yourself you should always be looking to evolve and to become a greater version of yourself and you know like matthew mcconnelly the actor for example i think he was in um, the wolf of wall street the yeah. wolf of wall street him he was asked one day who is your idol who is your idol and, and he, he responded by saying, my future self is my idol. Because mm -hmm. my future self is always one step ahead of me. And that's who I aim and aspire for. And then when I become that future self, my other future self in 10 years time from that one is also my inspiration, my idol, etc. Yeah. And, you know, we should always be continuing to evolve and to grow. And by recognizing that your very best self already exists, then it gives you something to aim and aspire for. That's why I say be the future. Because it's really an invitation to carry on evolving, to never stop growing, to become who you truly are. Yeah, yeah I imagine it might eliminate some depression symptoms too. It does. It does yeah. because you're no longer allowing. Like a lot of people allow their past experiences to dictate who they are and their identity. They look back to the past that's, you know, but the past if you, will just cripple your creative power if you allow every single aspect of it to define you. Mm -hmm. Your mistakes, the traumas, the bad memories, etc. Deal with them in the here and now if they come up. Of course, you've got to deal with that. But you don't need to keep revisiting it. You don't need to keep looking back. You don't need to keep on allowing it to define you. That's why in the Bible, for example, Lot's wife turns into a pillar of salt when she looks back. Because the past disempowers you if you allow it to define you, quite literally. Mm -hmm. That's it. So it's about really the way we allow the past to define us. We can also do that with our future selves as well. We can look up to the future and say, that's who I really am right there. While, of course, simultaneously owning and acknowledging who you are in the here and now. Yeah, and being well. okay with it, yeah. Being okay where you are in your process, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. So yeah, be the future is on my billboard, absolutely. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me this week. If you're listening and you like what you hear, please consider subscribing and rating this podcast as it really helps get this podcast out to other people who might be interested in hearing it but don't know about it yet. And also, if you'd like to contact me or reach me, you can reach me at unconditioningpodcast at gmail.com or unconditioningpodcast on Instagram. Thank you so much. And until next time, stay tuned in to you.